welcome to Tim's Take. And today we have a very, very special subject. Uh, this is our largest group. We have uh, three distinguished uh, faculty members, but we're going to talk about aromycine. And this is the 75th anniversary of the discovery of this antibiotic that has a, has had an impact not only in the, the livestock industry, but also the human uh, health. And we're going to start it off. We have uh, Dr. Bob Kramer. He's a soil microbiologist with the USDA ARS. We have Dr. Taylor Nelson, MD, and she works a lot with infectious diseases in, in, in humans, and Dr. Craig Payne in the Vet Sciences Extension. And well, welcome to uh, Tim's Take. Thank you. All right. Well, Bob, let's start with you. You're a soil microbiologist, and you've spent your life studying what's in the ground. What happened? How did we discover aromycin, and, and, and what is it? Well, I think we have to go back in time uh, as to see what was going on at that time uh, uh, in, in, um, in the uh, early uh, or the first half of the uh, 20th century. What, what happened is it all started with the discovery of penicillin, uh, which, which uh, was very um, uh, almost serendipity because uh, Fleming um, found, uh, who, who was working with Staphylococcus at the time as a, as a very opportunistic pathogen, left some plates out and uh, it was contaminated with a fungus. He came back and he saw all these growth inhibitory zones that uh, was, uh, the Staphylococcus was being inhibited. So that really started the the, the um, antibiotic age, so to speak, um, because uh, they found this was going to be very useful in, in treating infectious diseases from wounds and everything else that the human humans weren't be were not being treated for uh, very efficiently at the time. So uh, that was caused by a fungus, which was airborne. About uh, at the same time, there was uh, Selman Waxman was working at Rutgers University, was really into uh, looking at soil bacteria for various properties. And one of them was that they, they discovered that they had antibiotic properties as well against many of these pathogens. And some of these, uh, most of these organisms were act actinomycetes, or what we call now actinobacteria, which are very somewhat similar to fungi, but uh, they do have uh, filamentous or thread-like uh, structures on them. And uh, some, of the, some of the first antibiotics they discovered were um, very toxic to human cells or animal cells until they, until they f discovered streptomycin, which was from uh, an, an actinobacterium. Um, I, and I bring that up because they were the ones that discovered these in different soils. This was a, a, an organism from a very fertile soil at the time when they, when they found this antibiotic. And it was most, and they were really targeting to, um, tuberculosis bacterium, mycobacteria. And uh, he was such a promoter. Um, he went around the world promoting this antibi antibiotic, this new, new substance. And, uh, and he was also very shrewd because he decided to patent the antibiotic. The, the uh, Fleming in the uh, United Kingdom with penicillin did not patent it because uh, they felt that they were not in it for making any money. <laughs> uh, so uh, so what, this, what this meant was is that a lot of the pharmaceutical companies at the time were, were uh, waging this competitive race to get new antibiotics because they knew how valuable it was after they saw what penicillin could do. And this is how um, uh, we finally came here to Missouri through a, a scientist by the name of Benjamin Duggar, who was with Letterly Labs at the time, which is part of American Cyanamid. And they, want, they were pushing to get a competitive antibiotic as well. And so Duggar happened to be a former faculty member at the University of Missouri early in the uh, 19th or in the 20th century. Um, and then he went on to Washington U in uh, St. Louis. So he had connections here. And he, um, after he retired, I think he was at the University of Wisconsin. This was in the early 40s. Letterly Labs uh, hired him to do
do this search for antibiotics. Um, and then one of his colleagues here was Dr. William Albrecht, who was a soil microbiologist at the University of Missouri and had, had a lot to do with Sanborn Field, which is a historic field experimental site on campus, and at, requested him to send him several soil samples so that he could be, begin uh, screening those for organisms that might have antibiotic properties. And so this was apparently around 1944 when Albrecht collected these samples off of Sanborn Field, sent them to Letterly, and they did the uh, isolation and the screening for antibiotics at that time. So I'd like to point out uh, that, you know, this was all very tedious work. It was all culture-based, didn't have DNA gene probes at the time, so it took a lot of time. So both Waxman and Letterly Labs, they had just huge laboratory, laboratories uh, filled with plates of um, soil suspensions growing these microorganisms out and looking for uh, effects on their target organisms, which were the pathogens at the time. Um, so it didn't take very long that before um, Duggar found uh, a, a, um, uh, ac another actinomycete that was very produced a substance that was very uh, growth inhibitory to several organisms uh, that were causing infectious diseases. And uh, once they isolated that, they found the product. That was the discovery of oreomycin, uh, which was a tetracycline uh, antibiotic at the time. And this was caused by an organism called uh, Streptomyces aureofaciens. Uh, and uh, so that's where the oreomycin uh, name uh, came from. This, this um, I think, one of the first uh, disease organisms that it was effective on was for, was for uh, typhoid. And they discovered later on uh, it was also effective against many of the Staphylococcus, Streptococcus type. Uh, infective organisms, and and now we know it's it's effective on anthrax and uh, Lyme disease organisms as well. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that uh, that organism or that uh, antibiotic was uh, discovered in 1945, I believe it was, and was and was patented in, in 1949, uh, and uh, and then um, it was widely used throughout the 50s and 60s. Now, oreomycin means has, is that gold? Uh, yes, the pigmentation of that organism was a very bright gold color, mm -hmm. and that's where that uh, species name came from. The oreo. Oreo, yes. Because it, it, it kind of looks like that in, in the plates. Right, right. And mycin means well, mycelia, uh, doesn't it? Mycelia, yes. Isn't and that that's, a fungi? <laughs> yes, yeah, so that, that was very confusing. And, and as a matter of fact, Duggar would... He would actually call this a fungus uh, generating anti uh, generated antibiotic, and the reason I believe it was was that he was bi basically a mycologist in the botany department, and I don't believe that he really um, uh, studied much about the bacteria at the time because the actinos were known uh, back in the early part of the 20th century because Waxman was a guy that was working with these at the time, and he knew what an actino was, but for some reason with oreomycin, it's been, you know, the story that it was produced by a fungus has just persisted. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's even wrong on our plaque. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so so we always knew that actinomycetes were uh, bacteria. Yes. So you uh, taught me that in 86. That's right. <laughs> I just didn't pay attention. <laughs> um, now, actinomycetes are the, Aren't those the the organisms that give us that rich earthy smell? Right. Yeah, that's that's that's, and I think that's one of the reasons why they are such um, good potential for antibiotic production because they do produce all these very uh, complex compounds, uh, not only antibiotics but like the, the the compound that's responsible for the odor of fresh soil or in even the in the aquatic environment. Uh, the uh, compound is generally uh, geosmin, I believe, is, is what it's called, and uh, and it does it does have that particular volatile odor. Are there any other opportunities you think in the soil that we could find other 
beneficial? Oh, yeah. For, for humans and livestock? Y- yes. And uh, um, because most of these have originated from uh, the environment and mostly the soil. <clears throat> uh, and, and for very, and, and, you know, that was, Orimasin was one of the, was one of the early ones, and more were discovered in the soil. Oh, since then. Since then. Oh, okay. yes, yes. So quite, quite a few uh, variations of these antibiotics. And really, if you, if you really want to uh, show that uh, antibiotics are soil originated, just go and, and do, some, um, do, the, do a reverse work and go look for antibiotic-resistant organisms, and you'll find them all in the soil. Wow. Uh, natural, natural, naturally occurring because uh, it, it's an adaptation by many of the other um, uh, members of the microbiome that that have to face these antibiotics that are being released in the environment, so they develop these resistance mechanisms. So when we talk to Dr. Payne and Nelson, we can talk about can this help reverse some of these <laughs> antibiotic resistance right. that, that we have. All right, so now we get to set the, the stage set. We'll come back to you a little bit, Bob. For it's in 1948, it got published in the clinical journals. 1949, it got released into the to the public. What happened, Doctor Nelson? Wow, <laughs> that was um, an exciting time, I think, for treating infections, which we hadn't been able to tackle before. And <clears throat> to my knowledge, Ariamycin was really the first like broad spectrum uh, antibiotic discovered, and so we were able to treat a wide variety of different human infections. Um, and, you know, we've really, um, gosh, I think it was probably 10 or 15 years after Ariamycin, we developed uh, newer generation tetracyclines, which we still use extensively today. And so um, the predecessor for, um, you know, medications that I use on a daily basis almost, um, we're able to treat uh, staphylococcal infections, gram-negative bacterial infections, a wide variety uh, of kind of your typical bacterial pathogens, but also atypical pathogens, so intracellular pathogens that not many other antibiotics are able to treat um, with with things like doxycycline and minocycline and things like that. So we've really um, we've really expanded on that class of antibiotic therapy for humans, and it's uh, it's really a lifesaver for many many people. So it's hard to even imagine what it was like before penicillin and antibiotics. Mm-hmm. If you got a cut, you could absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, we were discussing before we started uh-huh. um, the the life expectancy after the introduction of antibiotics just drastically improved. Um, we when we were able to treat very very common causes of mortality, um, you know, streptococcal infections easily treated with penicillin, other infections easily treated with things like ariamycin, um, which which many people would perish from prior. Uh, or, or just being so disabled, mm-hmm. yeah. Because we, because we were talking about how in children, uh, sore throats turned into strep throat, into scarlet fever. Right, right. Yeah, very long term um, heart heart problems with strep uh, strep infections or um, you know long term kidney issues. So yeah, long term morbidity as well as mortality from infections like this. That that got reversed because of this. Mm-hmm. And as you said, we rode that wave into the 50s. And by, 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 by the 60s, mm-hmm. we go into second and third generation yeah. tetracyclines. But we're still using oromycin today in, in, in some things. Uh, I, I did, in humans, I don't know that we're using it a whole lot anymore because we've really, uh, you know, as far as side effect profile and ease of administration uh, and things with newer generations, um, we, at least in my practice, and I think probably – you know, commonly we use the the second generation right. uh, tetracyclines the most, but I think definitely in animal medicine, um, ariamycin, as far as I know, is still sure. still used. Yeah, and like in my generation, I probably took quite a bit of it sure. one time yeah. when I was a teenager yeah. and in, in into the eighties mm-hmm. that we used it quite a bit. We've talked a little bit about resistance, mm-hmm. and that's one of the reasons why that, that that we've gotten away from some of the that we had to have second and third generations. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, resistance is something that's always a a struggle when we're developing new antibiotics, bacteria, you know, pathogens are smart, 
and they figure out ways to get around it. And so we we are tasked with figuring out how to make antibiotics that are great even better over time. And mm-hmm. so so that's why we are we do use more of the the second generation, not and actually not so much the third generation, except when we're dealing with multi drug resistant um, or or really um, kind of exceptional types of infection. So second generation is is definitely what we're using. That's doxycycline and minocycline. And, and they do have an increased barrier to resistance, meaning they, that resistance doesn't develop as easily as our first generation um, tetracyclines like aureomycin. So. You know, when my kids were growing up, we would have to go to the pediatrician to get that pink fluid. The, the pink stuff. <laughs> the <yeah>. pink stuff. <laughs> and I used to think, I just give me a gallon of that. I just give it to them <laughs> as needed. But that would cause resistance when issues. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I think that's that's something, unfortunately, we're, de- you know, I, I think a lot of people probably had that attitude initially, right? Because we, we've developed these wonderful medications that treat things we, we didn't used to be able to treat. And, and why not have them on hand, give them when you need them? And so right. so a lot of my job now is is trying to pull back on that and, and practice restraint and preach restraint on on um, utilizing antimicrobials effectively, but um, cautiously and with good judgment, because unfortunately we haven't had new antibiotics uh, like classes in the pipeline for years and years and years. So um, mm. it, it's it's been a problem resistance. Now, did I read that they could even have some effect on some viral diseases? <sighs> So the tetracycline class can have some um, anti-inflammatory properties, I would say. So it's not necessarily an antiviral where it's killing virus. Mm-hmm. Um, but for example, if you have someone with a pneumonia and they get treated with a tetracycline class antibiotic, in- inflammation can be improved um, outside of the antibacterial effect. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it can, it, can, it can help with some of the, sure. the, side, uh-huh. the, the effects yeah. of, the, of yeah. the virus. Yeah. Because I know my mom got pneumonia back mm-hmm. in the 60s and it was... Touch and go. Yeah. But but probably a, a dose of aromycin and finding it with other ways mm-hmm. to help to get through yeah. that. So we had initially this huge uh, human element that some terrible diseases were being helped, were being cured. But it didn't take long for the livestock industry to catch on, did it? Dr. Well, uh, and that's kind of been the history of antimicrobial development in the livestock industry in that uh, what research has done in human medicine, uh, many antimicrobials have come from that research has been done and, and used in animals as well. Uh, of course, the, the new generation, the more potent antimicrobials that are available today, um, those are very limited if, if not used at all in animal health. But in the early days of penicillin, tetracycline, so on and so forth, those found their way into the animal health industry pretty quickly. I guess from the chlorotetracycline perspective or oreomycin specifically, uh, kind of my understanding historical wise is that one of the characteristics that was realized, not only its efficacy in treating disease, but, um, you know, they began to see this growth promotion Mm. effect associated with these antimicrobials. So whether that was improved rate of weight gain or improved feed efficiency, and so that kind of became common uh, use of antimicrobials in livestock was for those growth promotion feed efficiency purposes. Um, oftentimes those were maybe not approved to be used at treatment levels. So often at, a, at, at these lower doses, you would still see this effect. Um, the speculation as to why that I- I improved feed efficiency or growth promotion would occur at those lower doses is that maybe you're controlling subclinical disease. And so the animal would be able to grow better, uh, faster, less input, so on and so forth. Um, But what we have seen in concerns over relation to antimicrobial resistance, especially in 2017 is when that use for those indications all changed specifically with chlorotetracycline who had some growth promotion uh, approvals at that time, and uh, it was January 1 of 2017 where um, any feed-grade antimicrobials that had a growth promotion claim to it or indication for use, that use was removed and is no longer permissible. So that, that's kind of a brief history of... So we're not using uh, ROBIC and other antibiotics for growth growth promotion. Right. When we're talking these classes or what we call these medically important antimicrobials. So, um, 
when when we're talking about using antibiotics in general for growth promotion, there is a there is a class of antibiotics called the ionophores. So that would be for cattle producers. They're pretty familiar with products like Remensen and Bovitac, mm-hmm. which are some trade names. Um, those aren't classified as medically important antibiotics by the Food and Drug Administration. So those can still be used for those types of mm-hmm. um, growth promotion feed efficiency claims. But in, I believe it was in 2003, I believe it was, Guidance for Industry 152 came out from FDA. Um, They created a list of what we call medically important antibiotics that are used in not only animal health, but also in human medicine. And the idea behind that list is that any of these medically important antibiotics that are used in animal health, January 117, those were the antibiotics that were affected by uh, eliminating that growth promotion claim to it. All right. So Dr. Payton, so we, we have, uh, med- medically important antibiotics can't be used for, uh, growth promotion, growth, so, growth promotion, feed efficiency purposes. So, um, which, which really helps with not having re- antibiotic resistance, isn't it? Yeah. So the, the, the reason why that approval or that indication for use was done away with is for that very concern. So typically those indications were using, um, let's, let's focus on chlorotet or oreomycin. Mm-hmm. It was using them at a, a lower dose for extended period of time. And so the concern associated with that kind of use, low dose extended period would be antimicrobial resistance. And so that was um, part of FDA strategy in trying to mitigate antimicrobial resistance mm-hmm at least on the animal health side, is to do away with those indications in feed-grade antibiotics. So, Dr. Kramer, you, you've worked with a lot of agriculturalists that don't want to use antibiotics, correct? Right. Is it because of this reason, because we're using it for growth promotion or for, for, for diseases? I, can I put you on the spot on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of, um, um, as, as was mentioned, that uh, – uh, antibiotics had been fed to to livestock. That I think the biggest part of it is that they're, they're, they don't want to have antibiotic residues in the final product in the meat. Oh, that okay. When they're selling, uh, you know, especially from the organic farmers, and and, and I think the uh, the fact that resistance has been showing up in the antibiotics is 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 a, is a secondary thing that that now they realize that that's important. And they don't want to promote that as well because they still want them in case they have to. Like Absolutely, the, the, the organic, they 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 realize to save the animal's life they may have to use antibiotics, but they don't want to use that just willy nilly, right? And I should say, and I mean just industry wide from the veterinarians all the way down through uh, the producer level, there has been a lot of discussion about, um, you know what are these sustainability practices that we can implement to, you know, protect the efficacy of these antimicrobials? Because as already been talked about, um, new generation antimicrobials, not only is the cost of them astronomical to bring to market, but that pipeline is drying up. And uh, so I've heard people that, you know, focus on this topic quite a bit say, we better just plan on having what we have currently um, for who knows how far in the future. And so we better be a little bit more mindful of how we're using what we have because that's all we're going to have for a while yet. Yeah, that's scary in a way. Yeah. Definitely. That is because we always knew before, well, science would come up with a, with a new one that, that we can take its place. But that is both of you mentioned that pipeline has ran out. Mm-hmm. And did it set us up? With oromycin, when we were using it for humans, we were using it for livestock, and as a growth promoter, it's, it's amazing that it lasted this many many decades. It it is, and um, you know, <clears throat> that's not to discourage the use of it when you need it, right? Um, and I think that's something we try and practice and preach in, in my line of work is antibiotics are lifesavers, mm-hmm. <laughs> so use them when you need them, but be cautious and careful about when we need them. Yeah. Is there any could you even fathom how many people's lives have been saved by 
this? You know, it's probably innumerable even within, uh, you know, if I think about how often I use the newer generation, Mm -hmm. um, you know, tetracyclines, um, innumerable even in my career, which has not been extensively long Mm -hmm. yet. Um, So I I can't even put a number to it. Millions. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Millions, if not billions of of folks. And and mm -hmm. the impact on the livestock industry. Could you imagine what what it was like when we we would we, that we would have uh, outbreaks of, of disease right before and and the farmers were a lot closer to each other back in those days so you see so probably didn't have them carried from farm to farm much easier. There are also some human infections that uh, you know there's a lot of transfer I think between animals and humans with oh. diseases and pathogens and so um, protecting livestock can can protect humans um even on a like at a basic level of if you if you live downwind um from livestock i mean humans can get infections that way so wow. there's a there's a huge discussion surrounding this in the world of antimicrobial resistance this environmental um animal human and uh food interface that exists um so when you look at the, the the grand scheme of antimicrobial resistance, it's not human versus animal. It, it, it's there's this talk or concern that there's there's a uh, uh, there, there's an interface there that if you're using antimicrobials in animals, could you be promoting antimicrobial resistance in the human population? Yes. Um, whether that's resistant mechanisms or bacteria get into the food supply um, and humans acquiring it that way, or there's environmental contamination with antimicrobial uh, resistant bacteria. It's hard to quantify. Um, I, I think that's why it's so difficult for this to be a opening closed discussion because to, to do studies to to quantify to demonstrate it's it's very complicated or complex would be the correct term complicated is um, too simplistic of a term for mm-hmm. for what people are trying to determine this whole whole system of antimicrobial resistance involves but it's it's uh it's it's in my world it's the key point of discussion at this day in reg- in relation to antibiotics um, and that's what the twenty seventeen rules went and then then the ones just this past june 1st right so um and and we did the podcast Mm -hmm. a month or so ago in relation to you know up until uh 2017 there was a fair number of antimicrobials that were used in animal health world that were available over the counter especially in terms of feed grade antibiotics with oreomycin Mm -hmm. being a feed grade antimicrobial those went from otc to requiring a veterinary feed directive that year um, now this most recent change that is happening this year is bringing the remaining 4% of antibiotics that are available OTC under requiring a veterinary prescription, but it's all under the context of more veterinary oversight, more judicious use, hopefully getting a little bit better handle on or preventing resistance, um, so we can through keep, those actions. So we can keep this technology. Right so again, we, so, back so we to don't what, lose it. Back to what we said already. This is what what we've got right now is probably what we're going to have for some time yet. Oh, wow. In terms of antibiotics, that's still scary. <laughs> just, yeah. to, just even think about. Just even think about. So, Bob, let's go back to the soil. And you and I have been out Sandborn Field a lot, and and know those plots. And this was, came out of plot twenty three, which was continuous Timothy with no inputs. At that time, it was, when it was drawn out for 56 years, now it's been 135 years. Why that plot, of all plots, across the nation, you think? Well, yeah, well, <laughs> that, that's interesting why that particular organism came from that, that environment because uh, when you think about it, that was a, 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 probably an unmanaged plot. It, it didn't receive any... Uh, uh, manure or, or any other fertilizers, and uh, and actually at the at the time that plot was getting some um, uh, observation from the dean of agriculture, 
who had uh, mentioned to Albrecht that, uh, you know, this plot really looks bad <laughs> because there was a lot of this old sedge grass and, and uh, weeds were moving in. So it was, it was not very well maintained. The timothy, which, of course, was the forage of choice for uh, um, horses and mules at the time when we had the animal agriculture, uh, was beginning to die out. And the pH was very low. And that's what I find kind of uh, curious because actinomycetes are generally more favorable in a more uh, neutral type soil, you know, under about pH 6.8 or so. So in order, you know, the, the, the fact that they found actinos in a soil that was about a pH of 4.8 is, is quite interesting. So that might be part of the, the uh, reason why um, this organism was surviving in that soil was because it had to adapt to a rather harsh environment in its case, and uh, and sometimes when you're, when these organisms are under stress, they they tend to produce these types of complex uh, uh, products. So that may that may be you know that may be a reason. But did did Albrecht know that at the time? You know, I have I have no idea. I haven't seen any notes that were taken. <laughs> right. Of that. Uh, but I, I I just think that it's quite a contrast. Whereas Waxman with his discovery of Streptomycin was from an organism that was in a soil that was fully fertile, I think is the way it was described, uh, uh, high organic matter. So it, it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, it, it, it happened by chance. Wow. And we were very lucky on that. So if, if I uh, eat right, if I'm a human, if I'm an animal, I eat right, can I – you think ward off a lot of these diseases that, that I'm challenged with or the animals are or the plants are? <laughs> well, I mean, ha- having a healthy host is important. Uh-huh. So if you take care of your body, you, you have better, probably better capability of <clears throat> having adequate immune response to things. But there are some things that are, that are overwhelming to right. even your own immune system. So, um, so yeah, having a generally healthier lifestyle is, mm-hmm. is going to be helpful, but not for, not for everything. For example, Craig, I have a closed herd of, of cattle, right. and they are the healthiest looking things in, in the world. And I don't give them any medications, right? But but they well, eat well. Well, it, it's just not nutrition. I mean, there's mm-hmm. as you mentioned, there's this biosecurity, biocontainment mindset, trying to prevent introduction of disease, so on mm-hmm. and so forth. So it's it's more of this preventative mindset than it is cleaning up. <laughs> cleaning up the disease break with an antimicrobial. How do we pr- prevent getting mm-hmm. to that place in the first place? Right? But but being prevented by uh, giving antibiotics or other drugs is not the way we want to do it. Not in most cases. Yeah, right. there, there are some cases I could talk about, but um, but generally, no. All right. I, I didn't mention to ask you, Craig, but aromycin itself is still being used in livestock. Right. Um, the, at least from the cattle perspective, which is the world I deal with the most, a um, couple of key indications for use is for control or treatment of pneumonia, but probably at least more important here in Missouri, we, we deal with a rickettsial disease, anaplasma marginale, which causes anaplasmosis. Um, and, and you'll find a lot of um, beef cattle producers through their veterinarian writing a veterinary feed directive feeding chlorotetracycline or again oreomycin um, during tick vector season, which is this time of year, summer months, to prevent this disease called anaplasmosis in the fall of the year, which is a which causes a pretty severe anemia in adult animals, can result in death loss and some other conditions. So um, it's still it's still used a lot for those purposes and for treatment control of pneumonia in some cases in, in calves. So, but the tick borne disease, would that help with Lyme, humans, Lyme disease? Yeah, so <clears throat> doxycycline in the summertime is, um, you know, sometimes as a joke, we call it vitamin D um, because we have so many, so many tick borne illnesses here. And actually Lyme disease we don't have here in Missouri, but um, interesting you say anaplasma with livestock because we have human anaplasmosis, but not really here in Missouri. What we deal with a lot is ehrlichiosis, uh, in humans and and um, and other things too, maybe a lesser extent, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, mm-hmm. uh, tularemia to a lesser extent, and all of these things can be treated with doxycycline. The second it, generation. Okay, so is that aromycin itself? It's the second it, generation. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
Oh, yeah. wow. But with uh, what Walkman did and what Duggar did, that really opened the doors up for uh, all of absolutely. these. Absolutely. And, and, I mean, it's not – tick-borne illnesses are um, definitely a major use for doxycycline, but it can treat anything from, like I said, staph infections to syphilis to – to tick-borne to, I mean, you can you can run down a major list of things that these um, second and sometimes third generation um, wow. antibiotics and, can treat. Mm-hmm. And maybe if we get a, a grasp on uh, antibiotic resistance naturally, we could reverse some of this. <laughs> That'd be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, as we've kind of um, talked about quite a lot, I mean, resistance has, has definitely, it's something I deal with every day uh, uh-huh. with my patients and, and, and something we have to think about constantly. And so is there um, reversal for those pathogens that have already acquired resistance? Probably not, but can we try and stop it in its path uh, and allow for some more uh, susceptible bacteria to sort of take over? Maybe that's the, at least um, that's the way to go, so... And essentially what the animal side is doing now is doing what the medical field is doing on, on humans, limiting it, limiting well, and, the demand. And, and really it's a, it's a two-pronged effort in animal and human health. So um, even in the... There's a lot of overlap. Yeah. Right? yeah. In, in the human world, my understanding is there's a lot of discussion as well going on related to judicious use of antimicrobials. and Absolutely. Um, Um, Yeah, so uh, antimicrobial stewardship is a major part of my job as an infectious Mm. disease uh, professional. And um, and that so we dedicate a lot of time and energy and and funding into programs that help um, tailor our antibiotic use. And, and, you know, we when we need them, we need them. But being careful not to overuse the ones that are too broad or the wrong ones or use them for too long. Or so there's a lot of work on choosing appropriate antibiotics when we actually need them and, um, and as narrow spectrum as you can get. So. Well, this is a conversation that we can keep on going and going, but it's just so interesting that it started off with someone having the initiative to look into the soil, to take that one soil core and to actually finding that. And that, that day they found that it has, has such an impact 75 years ago, 75 year, year, uh, years later, and, and it will continue. So thanks so much uh, Bob Kramer, soil microbiologist, Dr. Nelson, uh, MD, and Dr. Payne, uh, vet, vet medicine. This is it for Tim's Take. We really appreciate your your uh, watching us, and don't and don't forget to subscribe, and you get these automatically. See you. Bye.